Dear laureates, excellencies, dear friends, I stand here trembling, Mohammed, because those words are the words that we should listen to and that we should not translate in the wrong way, but that we should not call that progress when you talk about revolution. We should hear the words that you and other laureates are speaking. And so as we're standing here celebrating children, I would love for all the young people of 18 and younger in this magnificent hall to stand up and that we applaud you. I see that a number of people older than 18 are also standing up. That's fine. <laughs> but that's what happens with adults. I'll talk about that for a moment. <laughs> We're celebrating 15-year anniversary of this wonderful prize, an annual signal to the world of the bravery, the determination, and the ability of children to make things different and to make a difference and your speech and all your work is really um, uh, what we're celebrating, and we should bear that in mind. So I would like to thank you laureates, past, present, and future, for a number of things. For holding up a mirror to us, for personifying the 30% of the world population younger than 18, yes, for bringing down the average age in this magnificent hall, but for most of us, and mostly to make us very uncomfortable. And I'm ashamed, I have to say, no, I know you're not blaming adults, but we should, in a way, be optimistically ashamed a bit. Because let's face it, the state of the planet the way it is, is because we haven't done the things that we needed to do. In 1992, I saw Severin Suzuki at the Rio summit around climate change, and she was speaking exactly the same language as Greta today. Let us not forget that. So today's prize is, of course, as was mentioned, part of the UN Convention, not part of, but really should be seen in the context of the celebration of the 30-year Convention of the Rights of the Child. There's so many different dimensions that were mentioned already by Mrs. Avrip, um, uh, and I'd like to pick out two elements that we should perhaps reflect upon. One article in particular, which is the article which is not implemented in any country in this world. And I'd also like to reflect on the way we should go forward and perhaps also to think, what is your role in this? So the article that is not implemented as the Kids' Rights Index showed in any country in the world structurally is Article 12. Now, I'm not going to ask that you know what Article 12 is. Some of you may, some of you may not. But Article 12 is the right for participation. It goes right to the heart of this prize, of course. And it is a strange article. I'm not surprised why it is not implemented. I'm sad about it, and I do what I can with, um, and young people are doing what they can to implement that right. Perhaps they don't need adults doing that. But if you think about the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, it's about the vulnerability of children, and rightly so, because there are many vulnerable things that we need to uh, get right. But Article 12 is about the strength of children and young people. And implementing that requires a different mindset of adults. It requires adults to see children and young people as equal, that they're citizens today and not young, naive young people of tomorrow, and that we cannot overlook them literally because we, tell, we constantly say children are the people tomorrow or in the future. That's nonsense. We also should realize that today's children are very, very different than when we were growing up as, adult, as children. 
So we should forget about the framing of the image that we have of children. Children and young people today, they show us every day how different they are. And to the cynics amongst us, no children don't have all the answers, but neither do adults. And we're still grossly underestimating the power of young people. So perhaps participation is the wrong word. Perhaps we should be talking about emancipation of young people. Because what is the emancipation? Emancipation only works when it's two-way street. On the one hand, the empowerment of those who were left behind and those who were unheard and unseen. In this case, the new voice, children. And emancipation also requires for the sitting order, the adults, another generation, to say, you know what, we can't do it alone, we need you. That becomes a very different relationship then. So emancipation, Article 12, participation, requires a fundamental redesign of our decision-making processes. And the question to all of us is, are we ready to go that far? And if we're not, then we know we will not be implementing Article 12. So my last point is about going forward. What does this mean? Three things. I believe we need to go to the next level of children's rights. And that children's rights are not an add-on, but that they should really go at the heart of all of our policies and decision-making and look at children's rights as part of our socio-economic paradigm and vision for our societies. Yesterday, I had the pleasure of being together with Kailash at the OECD, and children were right at the heart of the well-being of societies. Investing in children is the best return on investment that you can have. It's part of the inclusive growth initiative, and that's where children should actually sit, not as an add-on. The second thing is going forward on children's rights. I believe that there should be much more cooperation and alignment between all the players working on children's rights. On the one hand, all of the NGOs who are having one piece of the puzzle to align their strengths much more so that all of our efforts are actually adding up to something. The second one, and this is also about establishment and revolutionaries joining hands, it's about NGOs joining and, and actually facilitating the work done and listening to the work done by the children's and young people's movements that are going on. Because NGOs, let's face it, is also part of establishment. And the third thing is that I believe, and that builds on this, is that we should forge unexpected allyships. I give you two examples before I close. I believe that it would be wise to connect the children's rights issues much more to missions of others. And ABN AMRO, um, uh, working so hard on human rights, is of course very much closely connected to the issue of children's rights, and we should look for those kind of partnerships. And I also hope that we can start creating a community of adults, of decision makers, who intrinsically understand the power of children, not looking down upon them, but seeing them as equals, needing them in our decision making processes. If we can align and connect those decision makers, they can actually stand up and be the translator of the a tremendous force that young people around the world are organizing and that they should actually say, it's not a naive movement, we need that kind of voice. So with those three things, I can think we can create a sense of urgency, particularly in light of the ambitions of the Sustainable Development Goals. So in closing, I call upon all decision makers to make space for children and young people to help shape your thinking. And secondly, to see children and young people not just as inexperienced young people of tomorrow, but equal citizens and partners today. And all of us, we should ask ourselves, what do we need to do to make that happen? And I finish with a quote of young people 12-year-olds that I unraveled issues of the adult world with, and they came up with a new definition of leadership. And that definition goes, leadership is learning to let go of thinking you're the best. Thank you.